Hey everybody, it's Party Lead, and today we're talking about Victoria 3. After a weekend chock full of information from PDXCon and a couple of dev diaries now as well, I wanted to sit down and pull together everything we know about the game for today's video as a way to kick off my coverage of a game I am very much looking forward to. So put on your top hats, adjust your fascinators, cover your ankles, and adjust your ascots as we dive on in to everything we know about Victoria 3. The Setting Starting in 1836 and going until 1936, Victoria 3 covers all the years of Queen Victoria's reign with a bit of padding on either side. The world is a changed place, with new methods of war, new means of production, and new schools of thought starting to change the very fabric of society. Empires span across continents, many colonies have fought for and won their independence, and some continue to exist under the rule of their overlords. The 100 years that Victoria covers has a lot going on, and with a world map that spans the world right from the start, from my understanding the devs are using a system of counties, states, and provinces to split the map up into its constituent parts. There are over 100 playable countries, and many non-playable countries as well. These non-playable countries are still fleshed out with their own governments and names, and collectively they're labeled as decentralized countries. The developers are hoping to create a unique gameplay experience for them post-launch, so they will eventually be playable, but whether that'll happen through a free update or through paid DLC is yet to be shared. Now on this map here, you can actually see these decentralized countries across Africa, in Inner South America, and in North America, where you'd find the Lakota, Dakota, and Cree. Apart from these guys though, there are, yes, over 100 playable countries, and it looks like the British East India Company is marked as the same color as Britain and its other colonies, implying that colonies are being represented as single units under their overlords, even if nuance might imply things should be a little different. Canada, Alaska, Mexico are also all looking a little anachronistic, and the Middle East seems to have some of its borders drawn at random, which I guess is par for the course, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Overall, the historical setting will play a major role in the evolving stories of the world, mixing with game mechanics to create sometimes unexpected results. The American Civil War, for example, might happen if the conditions are right, though there has been mention of wanting to cover these topics without being overbearing or getting too... uh... dark. The devs want to keep things feeling somewhat hopeful. Despite tackling darker parts of history, they want to ensure that these darker parts of history come with relevant pros and cons that reflect their actual reality, why you might want to pursue them, why you might want to fight them, and what it means on either side of that fight, so to speak. And with history in mind, really quickly, it's been suggested that the East India Company is a tag, as is the Hudson's Bay Company, and probably more. So everything we're seeing here with regards to the map should be taken with a grain of salt, because we don't know just how many creatable tags there are, we don't know how this map will evolve, and to be perfectly fair and honest, the game is still in development, so all of this and everything else we're going to discuss today is obviously up for change. One more thing worth noting here though is the move to using the term recognized and unrecognized to classify countries that were or weren't seen as equals to the great powers at the time. This does away with the questionable terminology of Vicky 2, and it also removes many of the limitations that the uncivilized countries had in that game, though unrecognized countries will still have a harder time on the world stage. The devs have talked about how unrecognized countries can become recognized through action, like by defeating a great power in war. Countries aside, the map is being divided into 730 states at game start, which is the smallest unit of administration you'll deal with for political and economic purposes, and smaller states can actually be split off through various political actions mid-game. States themselves consist of provinces, and these are used primarily to organize the maneuvering of troops or when colonizing, which is done one province at a time. It's a pretty large map, and one hopes that it doesn't get too tedious or cumbersome to play as one of the greater powers when it comes to, say for example, war. But the approach Victoria 3 is taking should make war a rarity to begin with. Internal and External Affairs As per the design pillar they've termed Inward Focus, the main experience in Victoria 3 is about what's going on within your own borders, in your own country. While external affairs and events in other countries aren't completely unimportant, of course, Victoria 3 is pushing for a more inward focus. Your politics, your economy, your standards of living, your people's needs and demands, etc, etc. War isn't a driving force of the game. There is no 
traditional map painting, for example. In fact, the threat of war, rather than war itself, is a major theme in the era, and the precursors of war and the butting of heads on the lead-up to war is a major focus of the game as a result. The hope is always that you'll get what you want without having to fight for it, but of course, if you have to go to war, you can. With that said, you can play an entire 100-year game without fighting a single war, which ties into another key design pillar, diplomatic eminence. The idea here is that everything you can get from war, you should be able to get without it. Diplomacy should always be a matter of tense negotiations as opposed to a simple one or two click interaction. To that effect, diplomatic plays are being introduced as an attempt to get something from another party that can potentially, again, result in conflict, but doesn't necessarily pick one off right off the bat. Diplomatic plays can be used to conquer states, liberate subjects, make puppets, force the opening of markets, establish treaty ports, transfer subjects, annex subjects, cut down to size, which is a way to reduce a target's prestige, among others in the world. You can also use it to declare independence, ban slavery, make new territories, vassalize a people, return a state to its original holder, take colonies from others, unify regions like, say, Germany or Italy. There are a plethora of reasons to make diplomatic plays for various games. Now, the first step of a diplomatic play is for the asking party to put its demands on the table, with the opposing side responding with their own demands. It's a back and forth. It then evolves to the addition of war goals, and other parties can get involved with adding demands on either side as well. And when I say other parties, I mean not just the initial, you know, demander and demandee, if those are even words, but you, you, you get what I'm getting at. This is where other parties might have their own vested interests, which would draw them in if they have something to gain. Rivals might join if they want to keep their rivals in check. Um, there's also a bit of swaying involved. Either party can sway nations that aren't currently involved by offering them some spoils of war to join their side. But as more parties join a side, that side becomes a greater potential threat, which in turn pushes other parties to join the opposing side to keep that threat in check. Great powers will especially work against each other, and this all becomes a game about keeping balances of power in check. The idea is that either side is trying to get the other side to back down through a show of diplomatic and military force. Yes, both sides can also use their military might to add pressure, not through any actual fighting, but simply by raising and mobilizing troops. A show of force goes a long way in an era of gunboat diplomacy. Just look at how the US forced Japan to open its markets in this time period. Now, if a side backs down, the other side that didn't back down will attain their original war goals, but none of the extras when other nations became involved. If neither side backs down, eventually a timer runs out and war breaks out between all parties that were involved in the play with all the demands on the table. The risk of this always devolving into a world war is something the devs are keeping in mind, and the game is being balanced in a way to avoid that and to encourage players to take smaller steps rather than getting everybody involved every time they want something. And there's quite a risk factor with kicking off a diplomatic play since there's no such thing as status quo during the play. Either one side backs down or there's war. So it's easy to see how the game really focuses on the build-up to the hopeful prevention of a war and I'm quite excited to see how that all plays out because it's completely different to the usual in this genre. I'm really quite a fan of seeing war get tackled in different ways, and in this era where countless people can die in the drop of a hat, and there's this constant threat of the sheer terror and fear of war as weapons get more and more powerful, it's interesting to see how much diplomacy sort of takes the reins over here, and this tension of trying to prevent war rather than just declare it to take what you want is a very interesting angle. I'm curious to see again how it plays out, how it actually feels to play, and how it's balanced out, but in theory and on paper it sounds fascinating. Now it seems the consequences for war though, even in victory, can be quite severe, once again trying to prevent a player from just declaring war after war after war, but that's something we'll touch on in just a moment. First, let's discuss the Era of Change. This 100-year span was a period of great change. 
Technologically, politically, socially, ideologically, there were sweeping changes in not just how things were done, but what things were actually even thought. Technological and political revolutions of this era completely transformed the world, and Victoria 3 wants to capture this and the feeling of change over the course of the many years of a game. To encapsulate all of these various kinds of change, the tech tree is split up into three types. Economy, or production, military, and society. What makes each of these trees interesting is that they'll all consist of technologies that might actually harm your existing way of life in some way or another, and many of them might not be paradigm-changing, but will still be double-edged swords for any society. By way of example, a more efficient workplace might need fewer employees, resulting in higher unemployment and lower spending power for the population overall, which might mean a lower standard of living without government assistance, and maybe that's not the kind of society you want. You might try to actively avoid these technologies that would harm you, but beyond the technological advances made by your own research, the advances made by others can also spread into your nation, potentially shaking the foundation of your society. You can counteract this spread using censorship and by keeping literacy down, but this will slow down your own innovation rate and it will upset the intelligentsia. To encourage this kind of spread, you can instead work to improve your literacy rates and allow for a free press. Each tech tree is divided into approximately 10 tiers, and while the early tiers only have three technologies in them each, the later ones have up to 11. Inventions are no longer a thing like they were in Victoria 2, and I'm curious if something will replace them in concept. The production techs represent major civilian inventions that directly impacted industry. Dynamite, the cotton gin, the telegraph, railways, etc, etc. Military technology includes both hardware as well as actual doctrines, so you'll see things like ironclads and machine guns and tanks and planes, but you'll also see things like modern nursing and defense in depth, which have to be implemented after being researched to reap their benefits. Society tech is a lot more abstract in some cases, with romanticism and dialectics, but also includes ideas like urban planning and central banking. Ideologies like Anarchism and socialism will be found here too, as would civilian technologies that don't benefit industry directly. Antibiotics, malaria prevention, it's a bit of a catch-all for all types of social development, whether it's, uh, you know, more in, in, in the mind or, or in actual physical tangible technologies, and that's kind of what uh, society tech seems to cover over here. Things that keep people alive, of body and mind as well, I suppose. It sounds like, either way, the research of technology is either determined by or accelerated by the investment of innovation points. These are generated by university buildings and academics, and the number you can invest per week is determined by your literacy rate. So it sounds like this is to reflect the research done by the people responsible for it, but also the actual adoption of new ideas by the greater society. So you've got your, you know, academics doing the research, and then based on your literacy rate, whatever they come up with and whatever they discover or learn is actually spread amongst your population. Helping, again, your greater society. A society builder. Society is at the heart of Victoria 3. It's all about the kind of society you're trying to build, either by following the will of your people or denying it in an attempt to reach a personal goal. These are the driving forces in a game of Victoria 3, and while you'll have countless ways to exert your will and opinion, let's talk a little bit about how the people will try to exert theirs. Pops are a familiar concept now, especially with Paradox games, and Pops are back in Victoria 3, representing demographic chunks, each with their own culture, religion, etc, etc, with the claim being that this will be the most detailed simulation system yet which is definitely what it's starting to sound like. Over a billion people are modeled at the start of the game, and that number nearly doubles by the end of the game, including workers and dependents, the latter being people who aren't able to work, but might still make money from odd jobs and government plans. Children, for example, might go from being workers to dependents, depending on your child labor laws, something that hurts household income, but helps with literacy rates, so a bit of a balancing act there. Another interesting example of how POPs might go from working to dependent is actually war. I'm not sure exactly how they intend to simulate this, but it sounds like particularly bloody wars will leave people behind, 
who can no longer work and instead, like I was saying earlier, they become dependents too, severely hurting the economy and workforce. The types of pops we know about so far are varied. We have academics, aristocrats, bureaucrats, capitalists, clergymen, clerks, engineers, farmers, laborers, machinists, officers, servicemen, and shopkeepers. There's bound to be more, and you can kind of see already where the complexity that they've claimed comes from. As you can imagine, all of these pops will have their own wants and needs. Certain pops, who are so inclined, will lend their political strength to interest groups they align with, and we'll touch more on interest groups in a bit as well. This involvement in politics, though, is determined by a variety of factors as well, including literacy, cultural and religious discrimination, and the strength of the involvement in politics itself is determined by wealth, voting franchise, and more. So as you can see, these individual pops will all have their individual levels of desires to be involved in politics. They'll all obviously want different things. You know, an academic might want something very different from a shopkeeper who wants something very different from a clergyman. And depending on how well off they are, or depending on your society's voting franchise, they will have more or less sway on what you might need to do to keep your people happy. Now, apart from political involvement, pops will also try and simply live their lives. Pops work jobs and get paid wages, or they own industry and make money from dividends when their industry is profitable. This money will allow pops to consume goods based on their needs and wants, which are in turn based on their class and type, and any money that's left over becomes wealth, which helps increase their standard of living. A better standard of living creates loyalists out of pops and also increases growth rate, while a lower standard of living can turn loyalists into neutrals and then further turn neutrals into radicals. Radicalization is actually easier among the higher strata of society. They are quicker to get upset when they don't get their latest shipment of cognac or what have you, and they'll throw a hissy fit. And by hissy fit, I mean they'll generate turmoil, hurting the economy and potentially leading to uprisings if needs aren't met. Now, these are goods-based needs. I'm sure there are social needs as well. So it'll be very interesting to see how you have to balance the different classes of society and how you have to balance the different pops based on which kind of pops are more prevalent in your society to make sure you don't have a full-blown revolution on your hands. Now, police institutions can reduce the effects of radicals in an area, and you can actually try to drive radicals away entirely using the police. They're probably going to run away to a place where their needs are more likely to be met. Now, at times, interestingly, you'll also see intergenerational conflicts as radicals and loyalists die off with old age and as new generations start to get more and more political sway as they age. This isn't the only kind of conflict you'll see between pops either. Social mobility will allow pops of certain types to move between the three classes, lower, middle, and upper. This will all determine their wages and tax levels, and as a result, it'll also determine their political sway. Now, discrimination is a concern as well. Nations have their own state cultures and religions, and pops have their own religious and cultural designation as well. While there are no culture groups, per se, when two share linguistic ties or other heritage, people will get along well enough, but the more different they are, the more othering and discrimination you'll see. So you might see lower wages, and as a result, lower standards of living, and as a result, radicalization, especially where you have large populations of people who are of a different culture or religion than the state. In some places, discrimination takes on a different form, like racial discrimination, where racial proximity is a determining factor in the aforementioned conversation of discrimination. Migration is always a potential source of these kinds of tensions, and while migration mostly happens within cultural regions, to and from colonies and within one's markets, it can happen beyond those limits too. It's usually a slow process, but migration waves are triggered by events and can cause a mass migration. An easy example here being a famine in Ireland that might drive the Irish to the US. Migrants will always go to a place with a higher standard of living than where they are leaving. I imagine they'll also be attracted to countries that are more aligned with their own desires and ideologies. On which note, let's finally discuss interest groups and ideologies. 
Now it sounds like this is up for some reassessment after there was a bit of feedback from the community. That's great to hear, but for now let's talk about what it would have been and at a later date we can revisit it when we know how they change this up and deal with political parties and all that jazz. Now POPs can belong to interest groups, but there's a minimum level of literacy required for them to get involved with them, so some won't be in interest groups at all, especially if literacy levels across your nation are too low. It sounds like similar interest groups across different countries will have different desires, perhaps reflecting more localized or nuanced desires, which is absolutely fitting for the global scope. In fact, and we'll touch more on this a little bit later, but even in the terms of which goods your pops are interested in, will change depending on where they're from. An English aristocrat might want different things from, let's say, a, I don't know, Turkish aristocrat. Anyway, interest groups are able to influence your society based on their interests, of course, and in order to do so, they need to rely on their clout. Clout is initially a result of wealth and status, but as time goes on, clout comes through other means, like a more liberalized society might have clout in the hands of people who can vote regardless of wealth or status. Interest groups we know of so far include industrialists, landowners, intelligentsia, devout, armed forces, rural folk, petite bourgeoisie, and trade unions. Now depending on where in the world you are, sometimes these interest groups will have different names. For example, landowners in Britain are called landed gentry. In the US they are plantation owners, in Qing they are scholar officials, and in Prussia, I believe this is pronounced Junkers. I don't think it's I don't think it's junkers. I imagine landowners in Prussia are called Junkers, but feel free to correct me if I'm wrong there. Uh, meanwhile, uh, intelligentsia in Qing are known as the literati, uh, and the devout can either be, for example, in Britain, the Anglican Church, or in Qing, again, the Confucian School. So again, these are sort of generic terms for interest groups that we know of so far. There are almost certainly going to be many more, and I imagine their powers and weights and balances will change not only over the course of development, but over the course of an actual game as well. With that said, each of these will have leaders who will have portraits and traits of their own, and each of these interest groups will also have a set of ideologies, as well as traits for the group as a whole that can be active or inactive at any given time. Ideologies drive desires, and they can change over time, such as trade unions, that will become more socialist in their leanings as the years go on. These shifts can be triggered by certain events, ideas, and the aforementioned leaders who have their, again like I said, own traits. So if a particularly socialist leader takes charge of trade unions, you might see that trade unions start to become more socialist as a whole because of that leader's sway over his interest group. Now these interest groups can be invited into your government, or they might be in the opposition instead. and. Since you can only pass laws if at least one interest group that is part of your government approves of it, you need to pick and choose which groups you want to champion using authority, which is a capacity you earn through enacted laws, depending on how oppressive or authoritarian they are, allowing you to, again, not just deal with interest groups, but also ban goods or enact decrees. Now, as you're picking these interest groups, you have to be very careful because the more interest groups you have, the lower your government's legitimacy. The rate at which laws get approved is determined by how many interest groups in your government approve of the law, but interest groups that don't like the law will get upset if it passes, and if they get upset enough, you might see a civil war. So now you're balancing interest groups across your entire nation, interest groups that are in your government, interest groups that are in the opposition, their own individual interests, and your own government's legitimacy. A lot of moving parts just in trying to keep your pops happy because again this game is primarily a society builder so of course these guys are going to really push you in various directions that you may or may not wish to go in. Well, let's stop talking about society and its individual people, let's talk about the things that they want. A detailed simulated economy. This section is a big one, folks, so grab some popcorn or something, because the fully simulated cycle of production and consumption is the very heart of Victoria 3, with over a billion people at the start of the game, 800 million of whom are in a subsistence economy 
where they produced in a non-industrialized way to simply sustain themselves, something that you're going to see change drastically over the course of a game. There are over 750 states spread out across 150 markets. Markets are what determine a region where goods are traded freely under a single market owner, and these markets will change and evolve over time. There's no single world market in Victoria 3, but many local markets instead, with import and export between them limited in various ways as a result of a variety of factors that we're yet to see revealed. So while within the market there's free trade, trade between markets takes some effort, with there being room for mutually beneficial trade agreements as well as aggressive ones that either favor one party over the other or look to destroy entire industries in other nations. Perhaps unsurprisingly then, expanding your market is a key element of the game, and painting the economic map, so to speak, is a potential goal you might wish to pursue. Markets can merge together over time, reflecting historical trends, but the number of countries that can be under one person's market is determined by the influence of the market leader, with influence being another one of the aforementioned capacities that is also used to support ongoing diplomatic actions and pacts such as improving relations, alliances, trade deals, etc. With all of these moving parts, GDP is a major measure of your success, impacting your rankings based on the value of what you produce rather than your direct wealth itself. At the start of the game, there's about 500 million pounds worth of GDP spread around the world, largely in the private sector, and as time goes on, you might see some of this production get nationalized or otherwise changed, and as newer technologies and ideologies take hold, you'll see GDP start to shift drastically, not just in its number, but also in its distribution. Overall, there are 50 types of buildings and about 50 types of goods, some of which naturally aren't available until later in the game's timeline, and some of which can only be acquired in certain parts of the world, potentially leading to what we'll call political and military volatility. The goods are used to fulfill the needs of pops, and so these needs are what drive the flow of goods and the game as a whole, and the concept of supply and demand apply in determining the costs of these goods and the resulting affordability of them for your general population. Local underproduction of goods means you have to rely on imports and potentially suffer from exorbitant prices, while overproduction means goods might have to be sold at a loss, resulting in struggles for industries selling said goods. There's not really meant to be any such thing as a good price for products per se, it's just a matter of who benefits and how your society is built. See, if goods are cheaply available, consumers benefit, whereas if goods are expensive, the producers will happily take the profits. The way money moves is itself quite interesting. Government and military jobs are paid wages from the government, but industrial jobs, especially in the private sector, will have wages paid out to pops. These wages are determined by a variety of factors, including the type of pop that's actually earning the wage, so the same industry might have a few different pay rates for different types of pops working at said industry. It's very important to note that these private industries will always try to maximize profits as they consider wages to pay out, which is why you're able to enact government subsidies to try and help ensure decent wages. Of these wages, a portion will be taken from the pops who earned them as income taxes. And while the workers at an industry get paid wages, the owners of said industry get paid in dividends, as long as the industry is profitable. These dividends can also be taxed and wages and dividends are actually taxed separately, so you can see that as a way to tax certain strata of society differently based again on the kind of society you want to run. Now on the topic of taxes really quickly, there's also the often discriminatory and controversial poll tax, and you can also apply taxes on goods. Think like how the sin taxes make alcohol or tobacco products more expensive, meaning they might become harder to attain for some strata of society who might not have as much money left over after their wages are taxed. Taxes on goods should also play an interesting role in controlling the power, economically speaking, that your neighbors have. If a certain foreign power is producing a certain good and your people are buying that good, perhaps you should tax it heavily to either prevent its import or otherwise hurt that neighbor's economy. I'm curious to see if it'll work that way. I would assume so, but 
time will tell. Now, among all this talk of wealth and taxes, it's really important to remember that your wealth as a nation is separate from the wealth of your individual pops, and neither can be ignored. Overtax your pops, and they won't be able to afford basic sustenance, but empty your coffers, and you're trying to run a nation on favors and goodwill, I guess. As far as the types of goods themselves, staples are consumed by pops as a part of their basic needs, while industrial goods are consumed by industries to produce other goods. Luxury goods like silks, cigars, etc., those are consumed by pops with higher standards of living, and military goods are consumed by, you guessed it, the military. Interesting to note is that pops from different cultures will become fascinated with certain goods over others, inviting additional variety in play based on region. Now, buildings produce goods, sometimes consuming other goods to do so. In other words, they have an input and an output, but they also have a throughput, which is a numerical representation of their efficiency. Naturally, a more efficient building will be more profitable, and depending on the cost price and sale price of the input and output, a building may or may not generate profit. If it generates profit, as I mentioned earlier, the owners of the building will get paid dividends, which they can then use for various purposes we'll discuss in just a moment. If the building fails to generate a profit, the owners might choose to operate at a loss using cash reserves to stay afloat, though they might start needing subsidies or bailouts from the government, or ultimately, they might need to close down. Government-run buildings will always have government funding, but private entities are, of course, their own thing. On which note, production methods will determine who actually is allowed to own industries versus who does the work, and who gets paid and what amount. Privately owned is different from publicly traded, which is different from government-run or a worker cooperative, as you can imagine. Now, outside of the production of goods, you can also expect the provision of services to play a role. Services are non-tradable goods that stay in the home market, and they're generated by urban centers, which are established automatically as urbanization spreads and grows. Think of them as sort of a generic representation for the types of services the urbanized world might need. I don't know how detailed they'll get, but for now, we're being told they're generically termed as urban centers, and we can let our minds imagine what they might be. Bureaucracy, which is the third of the capacities, is also generated by buildings, specifically government administration buildings, where many of the nation's bureaucrats will be employed, paid wages from government funds. Now, bureaucracy is a capacity generated in other ways too, such as by a growing population, but no matter how you acquire it, it determines how smoothly your nation runs, resulting in potential waste or not. So you will want to generate this capacity, even though it isn't directly tied into the wealth generation of the goods and services based economy. Whether it's goods or services though, they both rely on your ability to actually get them to market. Food sitting in London is helping neither Ireland nor Bengal, and so infrastructure plays an essential role in the delivery of goods from where they're produced to where they're needed or wanted, and poor infrastructure will have an adverse effect on pricing. Again, prices are determined by supply and demand, and you don't really have a supply of goods at your local grocer if those goods are halfway across the continent, or perhaps the world. Evolving from dirt roads to railroads, infrastructure is determined not just by the technology or investment into it, but by the very lay of the land. Geography can have an impact on the viability on all factors, from what you produce, to where you produce it, and how you transport it, its raw materials, its byproducts, etc, etc. To this end, as I suggested literally just seconds ago, you'll see dirt roads and railroads, but you'll also see ports as a major infrastructure building. But infrastructure isn't just about building ports and stations, it's about acquiring the means of transportation as well, so it sounds like locomotives and presumably wagons will need to either be produced or purchased too, they won't just magically appear out of thin air. Now, all the specific talk of goods and their movement aside, what about the bigger picture of the economy at a national level? With different economic systems available to you, you'll see different types of behaviors, options, and outcomes. Command economies are able to switch production methods to be under government control, able to encourage and discourage consumption and apply consumption taxes more cheaply, at the cost of having fewer trade routes, the need to subsidize everything, and the driving away of capitalists and aristocrats who won't be able to find employment in a command economy. 
Free trade allows for more trade routes and reduces loan interest rates while giving capitalists larger and larger investment pools to work with, but subsidization here is limited to service industries and infrastructure. Agrarianism has more export routes specifically, with agriculture, infrastructure, and services able to benefit from subsidies, with luxury goods up for embargo if you so choose. Isolationists are cut off from foreign trade, forcing you to work within your own markets and customs unions, allowing you to embargo all goods while being able to subsidize all buildings and having larger investment pools as well. Traditionalism is typically reserved for pre-industrial economies of unrecognized countries. They have fewer trade routes and can only subsidize services and infrastructure. The choice of economic system will also determine what you can use investment pools to actually invest in, but the options are yet to be revealed. Unsurprisingly, yes, there is still lots to reveal considering the game was only just announced a couple of weeks ago now at PDXCon, but of course the dev diaries and the initial deluge of information has been great. But that's all for today folks, I hope you learned something here that you hadn't heard before. As the dev diaries start to come out, I'll take a look at ways I can cover those on the channel as well. If you'd be interested in more Victoria 3 content on the channel, make sure to subscribe because there's a lot more coming. As always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.